quite glad it's a holiday weekend and a lot of people are away because the chapter assigned to me tonight contains uh, two of the most controversial verses in the New Testament, verses uh, 11 and uh, 12. And uh, we'll be looking at these in due course. I suppose the the gender issue within uh, the church um, is particularly controversial um, because of the peculiar pressures of the culture of the age in which we are living. But uh, this is no new controversy. Um, The feminist movement in the early decades of uh, the 20th century was uh, quite strong, um, prompting the remark from G.K. Chesterton, a very well-known writer, uh, speaking about employment issue at that time, he said, thousands of women had declared, we will not be dictated to, and promptly took jobs as shorthand typists. There you go. Now verses 11 and 12 of uh, 1 Timothy 2, indeed 1 Timothy 2, provide no problem for those um, who don't have a high regard for the Bible. Who just say this is irrelevant, or Paul was a man of his times, or Paul was plainly wrong. But for those of us who are Bible-believing Christians and take the Scriptures seriously, we have to grapple with the text and uh, look at it carefully. But even Bible-believing Christians will have differing views on understanding of these verses. And as in many things, we have to come in a spirit of love and sometimes agree to disagree and to avoid any kind of division. Now, our subject matter, of course, is broader this evening. As I said at the beginning, we are considering the question of worship. Now, according to the New Testament, worship, um, technically speaking, really begins the moment that we leave the service and go out into the world. Because worship is spoken of as the life we live. Every activity, every area, every action is uh, under the New Testament understanding to be seen as an offering up of something to God to please Him. But because uh, worship is such a familiar term, we are going to continue to use it in the sense of public worship and church worship in the local congregation. And there are three things I want to say from um, this passage, chapter 2 of 1 Timothy. And here's the first. Church worship should be a contemporary expression of the unchanging truth of God. Church worship should be a contemporary expression of the unchanging truth of God. Now in the section which is devoted to worship in the church at Ephesus where Timothy was based you notice the reference that uh, Paul makes to truth. Verse 4 speaking of God who wants all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Verse 7 Paul says for this purpose I was appointed a herald and an apostle I'm telling the truth, I'm not lying, and a teacher of the true faith, that's to say the truth, to the Gentiles. So the section on worship uh, obviously flows out of the understanding of the truth of God. And Paul here in verses 5 and 6 gives us a short summary of the truth, of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He talks about the unique person, the man Christ Jesus. He talks about the unique way. There is one God and one mediator between men and God, the man Christ Jesus. He talks about the unique death. He gave himself as a ransom for many. And he talks about the unique author. God in Christ wills that all will be saved. 
So you have this summary of the truth given in these few verses. And when you read through the letters to Timothy, first letter and second letter, you find that Paul's charge to Timothy is preach the truth. Second Timothy chapter 4 and uh, verse 2, preach the word in season and out of season. So uh, preaching is to be the main focus for the releasing of the truth and worship is that which flows out of our understanding of the truth. Now it seems to me we've done something with uh, this word worship over the years for nowadays uh, we limit it, do we not, to the activity of singing and we divide it over against that which is proclamation and preaching and teaching of the word. Vaughan Roberts, who's a young preacher in the Anglican Church in Oxford and has written a very helpful little book entitled True Worship, um, speaks of the number of occasions that he's invited um, to preach at various places and sometimes he receives an instruction which says, now don't speak for very long because we want to devote as much time to worship. Don Roberts says, but how am I to worship properly unless I'm reminded of the truth? Because worship is an expression of the unchanging truth of God. I remember a number of years ago that I was speaking at St. Andrew's University Christian Union and the meeting started at 8 o'clock and we had singing, or as they called it, worship for an hour and then at 9 o'clock a lot of people drifted away and I was wheeled on to preach. Something wrong about that. I wonder if, if uh, we've got a wrong notion nowadays about worship in the sense that perhaps we think of it as something that you snort up your nose to give you a high. When actually worship according to the New Testament is something that starts in the mind as a response to the truth. And so worship is to be an expression of the unchanging truth of God and preaching is to be absolutely central to all worship occasions. But it has to be a contemporary expression of the truth. It's not something that is to be bound to a previous century. It's to do with the century and the time in which we're living. And so there has to be up-to-date songs and up-to-date prayers and up-to-date preaching relating to the contemporary situation and we see it all of course as aiming towards that worship of God with our lives A.W. Tozer great uh, American devotional writer put it like this the purpose of God in sending his son to die and rise and live and be at the right hand of God the Father was that he might restore to us the missing jewel, the jewel of worship, that we might come back and learn to do again that which we were created to do in the first place, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness, to spend our time in awesome wonder and adoration of God, feeling it and expressing it and letting it get into our labors and work and activities and doing nothing except as an act of worship to Almighty God through His Son, Jesus Christ. So church worship should be a contemporary expression of the unchanging truth of God. And here's the second thing I want to say. Church worship should be a continuous expression of thankful dependence on God. Verse 1, I urge then first of all that requests, prayers, intercession and thanksgiving be made for everyone. Now we saw last week that there was a crisis in the church at Ephesus. The crisis was related to false teaching in the church which was disturbing many in the congregation. And so, what are we to do in this situation? Timothy might well ask, and Paul tells him. Paul tells him that the first thing to do is to call the church to prayer. Gather the church together in the prayer meeting. Prayer was absolutely essential 
as an expression of thankful dependence on God. So whereas preaching is the activity we focus on under the first heading, prayer is that under the second heading. And when you think of it, prayer is an essential expression of worship. What are we doing when we are praying? We're really saying we don't deserve anything. We're saying we don't know anything that can perhaps help us in this situation. And we're saying, thirdly, we can't do anything in our situation. In our helplessness, we are turning in humble dependence to God. And that's worship. Worship is thankful dependence of God. In verse 3, this is good and pleases God our Saviour. So, prayer is the business of the church because it is an expression of, of worship. And you see that uh, prayer was a priority of the worshipping church at the beginning. You may remember in Acts chapter 6 what the apostles did when they were surrounded with all kinds of demands upon their time and we read these very famous words in Acts chapter 6 the apostles said we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word you ever heard Eric Alexander the former minister of St. George's Tron preaching on that famous verse in Acts chapter 6 and you might remember what he said in connection with that verse applying it as a general lesson to prayer he said prayer is not supplemental it is elemental I'm saying it in the way that only Eric Alexander can say it with due gravitas and, and weight prayer is not supplemental that's to say it's, it's not something that's a, an option um, you either choose to do it or choose not to do it within the church context whether you feel like it or whether you're up for it. It is absolutely elemental and foundational at the very heart and centre of church life and church worship. Notice three things that he says about uh, this uh, uh, prayer here. It's comprehensive scope, verses 1 and 2. I urge then that requests, prayers, intercessions and thanksgiving be made for everyone for kings and all those in authority that we might live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. There's something all embracing about prayer that's at the very heart of worship. Now, Paul is probably saying this to counteract the false teachers who in their false teaching were gathering together a very inward-looking, inclusive, narrow, Jewish subgroup. And in contrast to that, Paul is saying to Timothy, what we are involved in is something that is all-embracing and comprehensive in its scope, and it begins when we get down in our knees as a church and pray in thankful dependence to God. When we first started the Wednesday prayer meeting about 25 years ago, uh, we were branded as a holy huddle, and those who went along as Alanites. Sounds a bit like stalagmites or stalactites, doesn't it? But if they'd known what was happening on a Wednesday night and what has happened is that the whole nation is to be our scope and indeed at times the whole globe is to be our parish as we pray for the needs of missionaries and, and people here and there and everywhere. It's comprehensive scope. Secondly, it's evangelistic power. I urge then, first of all, that prayers be made. Verse 3, this is good and pleases God our Saviour who wants all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. And again, this was probably an instruction that was given to counteract the false teachers because the end product of their false teaching was just a talk shop. You remember chapter 1 verse 6? It leads just to meaningless talk. That's what they were ending up with. God forbid that we should end up merely being a talk shop in the Christian church. Now we are good talkers in this uh, congregation. 
we talk to each other uh, readily and easily. But sometimes, you know, it seems to me when we close our eyes and bow our heads and talk to God, sometimes the talkers go very silent and quiet. And yet talking to God is the most important thing of all as a church, as a congregation, and as individual people. Because it's there, apparently, that evangelism begins. It is there that the first waves of divine power reach out to the community and the world outside. That's what all has always happened down the centuries. Think of what happened in the island of Lewis in 1947. Evangelism began with these two blind sisters when they got down in the straw in the barn and barvis and prayed, as we would say, their socks off. They said, God, you promised in the Bible that you'll pour water on those who are thirsty. And Lord, we're thirsty, so keep your promise and pour out that water on the thirsty. And they kept on praying this kind of prayer request until God heard an answer and poured out the waters of the Spirit upon that little community of Barbas. You remember the story in the, in the dance hall one night the dance stopped because the Spirit of God came down and people were converted. You know, I feel I've got almost a kind of link with these two elderly blind ladies who prayed in the barn at Barvis because the very first convert, the very first male convert in the Lewis Revival in 1947 was the father-in-law of the surgeon who operated on me two years ago last Wednesday. So thank you ladies in the barn at Barvis for that. But the point is that evangelization begins when people get down on their knees and pray. And that's how it has to be with the local church in every setting and in every age. This prayer has comprehensive scope and it has evangelistic power. And thirdly, it has a unifying challenge. Verse 9, I want men everywhere to lift up holy hands in prayer without anger or disputing. And again, I think this instruction is given in the background of a false teaching because the false teaching was leading to divisions and quarrels and arguments in the local church. And here is a call to prayer, which is therefore a call to unity. Because you see, you cannot sit down in disagreement with a brother and sister and pray together. You just can't do that. And prayer sorts out this kind of thing. And prayer is a challenge to unity in the congregation. Now, some of you young folks, all of you young folks, and many folks who, are, uh, who have come into the congregation over the years will not know some of the tremendous disagreements and conflicts in the early years of the ministry. Tremendous conflicts and tensions. And I tell you, the only way that they were resolved was in the Wednesday night prayer meeting. As we prayed to God for His peace and His power. And He brought a measure of unity and togetherness. These are notes for the next generation. I want to ask you young folks, have you really caught what the New Testament says about the absolute, elemental, foundational priority of prayer in church life? You see, these notes are for church leaders, church pastors of the next generation. And if we're going to build a church that's going to do something for God, then we've got to have prayer right at the center of church life. something that we make time and sacrifice for and come together for Wednesday night was a small number of us only. but God drew near as person after person said in prayer God's come near to us tonight and he does that 
if we make time for him and seek. So there's the second thing I want to say. The first thing, church worship should be a contemporary expression of the unchanging truth of God. Secondly, church worship should be a continuous expression of thankful dependence of God. And thirdly, church worship should be a cultural expression of the revealed order of God. Now that's a bit of a mouthful, but help me to try and explain it. And here we're coming now to the the gender issue, the male-female issue that uh, Paul is writing for. I've been trying to delay coming to this for as long as possible, but I can't dodge it now. Um, Here we are. And uh, it seems to me that the New Testament's teaching on uh, the male-female contributions within the local church is something that is partly cultural and therefore changeable and partly to do with the revealed order of God and therefore timeless. And I think you see an indication of that, these two things, culture and the fixed order of God, in in verse 9 which introduces this little section, 9 to 15. You see, first of all here, the revealed order of God for ladies in the church at all times, that is to say, to dress modestly and to adorn themselves with good deeds. Okay? Now that stands in the first century and in the 21st century and all centuries in between. That's the revealed order of God and and will of God. But there is the contemporary expression of that, which can vary from the first century to the 21st century and everything else in between. I mean, I really don't know what braided hair is. But I understand that in Ephesus, where Timothy was based, the prostitutes wore their hair with this braided hairstyle. And so in Ephesus, the cultural expression of this principle is don't have braided hair. I don't know how you design, define expensive clothes, but I do read that in the Greco-Roman world, the world of Timothy's day, there was a notorious example of a bride who had a bridal dress which cost the equivalent of £426,000. And so in Ephesus, The cultural expression of this timeless principle is don't wear expensive clothes. And there are many things in the New Testament uh, which is a mixture of culture and the revealed order of God. For example, foot washing. Jesus washed his disciples' feet and then he said to them, you ought to wash one another's feet and that instruction comes down the ages to us today so yes and no I hope surely there is a more appropriate cultural expression today of that principle of serving our brother with humble lowly service so you see in the New Testament with many subjects There is a question of the cultural expression and the revealed order of God. And that, it seems to me, because it is the case in verse 9 and 10, is likely to be the case in verse 11 and 12. Now the skill is trying to find out what is culture and to find out what is the revealed order of God and is timeless. Reams and reams have been written on these two verses and I'm going to tell you what I think. I wrestled with this uh, all yesterday afternoon. I don't know what you were doing yesterday afternoon, but I'm sure you weren't doing what I was doing. I was wrestling with verses 11 and 12. And so, can I ask you to listen carefully to what we're saying now? I'm afraid I don't have any nice funny stories or fancy illustrations, just words, words of explanation as I understand these verses seems to me that in verses 11 and 12 we have four commands given to ladies in the local church there at 
Ephesus. Uh, four commands, and it seems to me that they're arranged in two pairs. The first pair, don't speak and don't teach men. The second pair, be in submission and be under authority to men. Now you can see right away that these pairs are quite different. The first one is to do with activities, don't speak at all, don't teach, and the second is to do with roles, be in submission, be under authority. Now it seems to me that when you look at the roles, be in submission, be under authority, then we have here that which is God's revealed order of things. And when we have don't speak at all, don't teach, we have that which seems to be a cultural expression of this revealed order of God, as it was in Ephesus at that time. Let's look at the roles first of all. Be in submission, be under authority. And Paul seems to base this upon what was right at creation, verse 13, and what went wrong in the fall, verse 14. In other words, it goes right back to the very ordering of life. Now it's very important when you're trying to understand Scripture to interpret Scripture by Scripture. And there's a very vital cross-reference that I'd ask you to turn to now, and that is 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 3. First Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 3, where Paul says this, Now I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. It does seem in association with the text in First Timothy, then that God had a revealed ordering for us of things so that there is a kind of headship of man over woman. But the interesting thing here, it seems to me, and perhaps you'd agree, is that the pattern of this male headship, which in the New Testament seems to be worked out in two areas, marriage and in the church, the pattern of this headship is that which we see in God himself, in the role of the Father towards the Son. And here, it's a role of headship. There is absolute equality between the Father and the Son in essence, in being, in nature, in character, in status. But they have different roles. The Father is the head of the Son. The Father is the one who plans salvation. The Son is the one who came to accomplish it. But in the end of the day, it is the Father who will assume headship. Do you remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, when the Apostle Paul talks about everything being put under the feet of Christ, and Christ taking everything and giving them to the Father, so that the Father becomes all in all. There is this headship of the Father over the Son. It's a different role, you see. And Paul is saying, well, that's the pattern for God's different roles of male and female, men and women, to relate to each other. And when you think of it, that's a very powerful picture, isn't it? It means that man's headship must be caring, not crushing. It must be loving, not proud. It must be self-sacrificing, not self-asserting. If you keep in mind always the Father and the Son, the Son and the Father. And one has to say that uh, in the history of the church that pattern has not 
being followed always, and some might say often, but it does seem as though there is this revealed order of headship. It's to do with different roles, absolute equality in status, in salvation, but differing roles. Let's move from the roles to the activities. Don't speak at all. Don't teach. Now I'm suggesting that this was likely to be a cultural expression of this timeless truth of headship in Ephesus at that time. Why? Well, probably because of the, the temple of Diana in Ephesus, where there were hundreds and hundreds of priestesses who spoke and taught and manipulated men into their ways. So Paul said in Ephesus, the cultural outworking of this revealed principle is don't speak at all, don't teach. But as you look through the New Testament, you see that that kind of expression changes. There are ladies with speaking abilities, ladies with teaching gifts, so that at Crete, where Paul writes to Titus, you find the widows in a teaching role. Or in Rome, you have mention of Phoebe and Junia. One was a deaconess, the other was called an apostle, a messenger, and obviously speaking and teaching. You find in Acts chapter 18, the first mention of Priscilla and Aquila, and Priscilla obviously had speaking and teaching gifts. So the cultural outworking of this revealed order of God varies depending upon the setting. So the question is, what is the appropriate cultural expression in our day and age and setting of this revealed order of headship? Man over woman in the church. And people will have different answers to that question. And all of us must seek to be faithful to God's truth and to God's word. And to deal with utmost charity and grace with all different needs. Well, you say, what about verse 15? You've not touched that yet. Very strange verse. My understanding of that verse is in line with John Stott's uh, interpretation. You see, our version here doesn't make clear that there is a definite article so that it should really read women will be saved through the childbearing, or as one other version says, the birth of the child, namely Christ, the reference back to that one mediator between men and God, the man Christ Jesus, speaking of Jesus and saying that women and men, all of us equally, will be saved. How? Through Christ, through the birth of this one mediator, Jesus Christ. And we all progress in the Christian life in the same way, faith, love, and holiness. So there we have it. That's how I see it. And the important thing in these notes for the next generation in this question of worship and these three aspects that we've looked at is that we should seek to honor the word of God that we should seek to obey the word of God that we should seek to work out the implications of the word of God and to seek to have the utmost integrity in line with the word of God and in all things, to have this thankful dependence upon God our Saviour. For that is the essence of life. Coming constantly to depend upon his grace. And thankfully, to yield ourselves afresh to him. So may God bless his word to us all this evening. Let's pray.
you have called us to love you with all our minds and our hearts and our souls and we ask that uh, we might first acknowledge that we don't use our minds to study what you have given to us in Holy Scripture as we ought. We don't engage our minds to learn and to understand what you have taught, but want rather to rush quickly to experience and to enjoy good feelings. We pray, Lord, that we might understand that you have made us with mind, heart and emotions so that all faculties and energies of our beings might be used to worship you and essentially to go out and to live that worship in daily relationships of life amidst the natural strains and stresses and tensions of life to offer ourselves up as living sacrifices to you which is our reasonable act of worship we pray, O oh God, that by your grace and by your Holy Spirit you might give to us light upon this, your word, and these difficult texts and issues, and grant to us the wisdom not only to grasp with our minds, but the insight to apply to our situation in contemporary life, so that your name might be honoured and your word extolled because you have said that you will exalt above all things your name and your word help us to give you your place in this church in this congregation in this fellowship in this generation of leadership and in the next generation so that the gospel may spread and your name be glorified through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.